Hello everyone, I'm Brownfield's Rhiannon Branch and I'd like to welcome you to the video series Navigating Preparation for the 2023 Growing Season. It's a content partnership with Burris Seed and today we're going to look at a farmer's perspective on the subject. We're happy to have Pete Gill join us for this conversation. Pete, how are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, today's a, a bit, the weather's been great and uh, the growing season's been uh, coming along just fine. So we're starting off on a good day. Good to hear, Pete. Well, uh, I'll let you begin by uh, telling us a little bit more about yourself, maybe uh, where and what you farm and your affiliation with Burris. My name is Pete Gill. Uh, I'm part of a uh, multi-generational farm uh, that we've been uh, on our home farm. We're uh, closing in on 150 years on our uh, homestead. And um, uh, I farm with my father, uh, Gene Gill, and uh, he and I uh, do most of the farming. We do corn, soybeans, some wheat, and we do some vegetables for uh, Seneca Foods. And uh, we grow seed beans for uh, the Burrises. I have had a uh, the relationship that our family has had with the Burrises. We started selling seed with them about 1995, so we're a little over 25 years that we have been uh, uh, selling seed for the Burrises. That uh, um, we have uh, found that. Uh, their products work well on our farm, and uh, we appreciate their their family and their research, and that uh, has worked well for us. Very good. Well, let's uh, kind of look back here. Uh, how has the 2022 growing season been so far for you in your area? Uh, we generally get started planting corn and uh, follow shortly behind that with, uh, with soybeans that... Uh, we plant uh, both at the same time and uh, started both crops there in the last week of April and finished up in the first week of May. Um, then we, uh, growing season moved into May. We had some pretty good uh, conditions in the month of May and then it really started raining. Uh, in the month of May, we had uh, adequate rainfall to uh, get the crop off to a good start. We had good weather. June rolls in. We've had some very hot, very dry weather, uh, some hot overnight temperatures that uh, uh, made us kind of question whether the uh, our ear development was going to be everything that we wouldn't hope it would be. That uh, in the month of June, when we're trying to when uh, the corn crop is starting to determine ear size, we're concerned with the hot weather that we had as to whether it was going to uh, uh, stunt the ear uh, sizes and what we were gonna come from that. June, we, or late June, July, we had adequate rain. Uh, we had a nice open window to uh, get the wheat harvested uh, and get the straw baled. So we had very good uh, conditions for that. Uh, August, we've had uh, uh, rainfall come at, uh, uh, at, at times when we uh, really needed it, when uh, the 90 degree weather started coming around. We uh, ended up getting some nice rainfall. And uh, so we've had really good conditions pretty much throughout the, the growing season. One thing that I did notice this year, and we do have a lot of windmills uh, in, our, in our farm, in, in the circle where we farm. And uh, generally uh, we can always count on at least one or five fields that will uh, have some kind of wind damage to it, whether we get uh, green snap or just uh, wind up having a uh, uh, wind that lays the corn down and stands it back up. But this year we did not have that. And uh, you know, we have noticed that uh, there just isn't a lot of holes uh, in the corn crop uh, this year. Soybeans as well have seemed like that they have been uh, growing very well. We've got a good pod set uh, on the soybean plants. Soybean plants are tall. We have a lot of nodes, so we're kind of hopeful that uh, the soybean crop is uh, going to be a good one this year. Well, that's good to hear, Pete. Uh, always like to hear when farmers are, are experiencing some good conditions, especially when there's uh, so much volatility with some of the other things going on in the ag industry um, with that being said, you know, uh, harvest time here, you're also 
planning ahead for the 2023 growing season, what kind of preparation are you doing right now for next year? So the uh, uh, fertilizer uh, dealers have come around to uh, speak to us about uh, purchasing inputs for this fall that we have, uh, uh, you know, already made our decisions for uh, anhydrous ammonia and uh, we're working on our decisions for uh, uh, phosphates and uh, potash uh, for our crop uh, for this fall. Um, a lot of times when the fertilizer dealer comes in, he says, uh, today, you know, this is the price that we have for today. And, uh, you know, we may have it good for a week, but uh, that's about a, uh, that's the window that we've got. And, uh, and it's a pay today as well. So that has uh, presented a challenge to us, uh, you know, especially in cash flow. Uh, that um, you know, we've sold all of last year's crop and there really isn't a whole lot more income coming in, uh, you know, until we get into uh, September and October here. So it, uh, it has been such that we need to kind of watch what we're doing in terms of, uh, you know, not only uh, getting our prices set for our um, uh, dry fertilizer prices, but also, you know, we need to, uh, you know, kind of hedge ourselves by, uh, you know, making sure that we've got uh, uh, those inputs covered, uh, those costs covered by making some forward sales uh, for that 23 crop as well. We have some good prices for that 23 crop. So, you know, you know we are taking advantage of those, you know, if we're going to pay, you know, these higher prices, you know, even though we're not as high as what we had paid last year, it's still significantly higher than what it had been the previous three, four years. That was going to be my next question, Pete, is how some of these challenges right now compare to this time a year ago when you were preparing for this season. So a, a year ago, we had made a decision very early on. We felt that uh, you know, we had prices rising into the harvest and you know, we went in and bought our uh, inputs very early and we just saw rising prices throughout the fall. And then, you know, it was even higher again there in the spring. So we we're kind of happy that we had or made our decisions that early. Uh, knowing that we had a, raising, a rising market, we needed to uh, you know, make some decisions pretty quickly on that, that we felt that uh, we were going to you know, see those types of, uh, we were going to see that type of rise in price in the inputs. <clears throat> the one thing that we're really concerned about this year is where our drying costs are going to be. Uh, we don't have the... Uh, we would have the ability to hedge a uh, contract for natural gas or propane on the board, but you know that's a pretty sizable stake that a person has to take, uh, you know, to manage those costs over what we're in. The other thing with, uh, you know, we do have a system, uh, we have our own grain system where we're able to dry most of all of our own corn that you never know what year is the year is going to be, are we going to be uh, having 20 to 30% corn all year where we're going to have to run the dryer throughout the season and dry every kernel that comes through the farm? Or is it going to be a year where you know, we have some nice warm weather throughout September and October, the crop goes ahead and matures, dries down, and uh, we get uh, down to you know, 15%, 17% corn, where we can just go ahead and put it into storage and, and uh, just let our, um, the bin fans, uh, you know, manage the, uh, the quality that, uh, you know, a year ago, we thought we were going to spend a lot of money in drying corn, but uh, the corn quickly dried down um, as we got into the last half of the growing season. If we had anticipated on buying a lot of, uh, natural gas, we wouldn't have used everything that we had uh, had planned for this year, uh, you know, not knowing what uh, what the weather is going to bring. And we've got natural gas prices that are twice what they were a year ago. Um, I don't think I want to have a lot of ownership of natural gas at the end of the season when they're looking at uh, prices that are probably going to be 20 to 30 cents less next fall in the fall of 23. Pete, on this topic of 
preparing for 2023 while still juggling what's happening here in the fall of 2022, what would you say are your top priorities? Where are you going to spend your money to help protect your farm's bottom line? You know, how can you kind of manage that without cutting corners and still being able to positively impact your yield? Well, as we kind of have, uh, we talked about earlier on on uh, the uh, on the fertility uh, part of our uh, uh, you know our, our farming plan. You know, we've pretty much have made those decisions for our uh, our nitrogen expenses and our uh, uh, P and K uh, prices that we're pretty much managing those uh, uh, the what we the money that we've already put out that we're going to. Uh, try to cover with some kind of hedge, some kind of uh, floor, or uh, just make some forward sales to um, you know make sure that since we've paid a high price for our those inputs, you know let's make sure that we've got revenue on the other side to keep our margins where they need to be. Uh, the corn uh, salesmen are going to be uh, starting going around now. Everybody's got uh, uh, corn prices. It seems that uh, they still do have uh, uh, some early pay uh, discounts that are going to be available. So we'll probably try to uh, manage our early pay along with uh, uh, some uh, uh, financing uh, plans out there and see what uh, works out best for us. Uh, see if there's some zero percent financing available out there, and um, you know that way that we can go ahead and select the best uh, corn uh, hybrids that um, you know get the corn hybrids that we want. You know by doing a mix of paying, uh, you know taking some of those uh, seed discounts and uh, um, you know making sure that we get our orders in early to uh, get the corn varieties. One of the important things is is, is to uh, uh, know what varieties are going to work well on your uh, on your farm, and we try to watch the uh, uh, you, how things you know uh, the corn varieties that have been in the top five, top ten of uh, some of the independent seed trials out there. We make sure that we uh, plant a good share of those. We know that they're not going to be the top on the farm you know, uh, the next year, the next year, but we know that it's going to be uh, there at, at, you know, uh, one of the top three, top five varieties that we plant. So, you know, we do want to make sure that we're uh, selecting varieties that are going to yield well. Uh, we also try, uh, you know, the new varieties out there uh, that uh, the companies have been testing for a couple of years, and we trust their research that they've uh, uh, planted them on soils that are similar to ours in regions that are similar to ours so that we get a good uh, uh, a good variety of uh, uh, different corn out there that we're not just planting uh, a lot of the same uh, numbers uh, and uh, wind up having putting ourselves in extra risk by uh, having too much of one uh, one number. So uh, that's how we manage our seed. Uh, fuel is going to become, is becoming an issue. We just want to make sure that, uh, uh, we've got enough fuel on hand to get us through, uh, the, the diesel exhaust fluid. We're making sure that we've got enough of it on hand. Uh, several our machines are running that. So we want to make sure that that, uh, winds up not being a, uh, a handicap. Uh, then we move on to uh, uh, the machinery and the parts. <laughs> and, uh, uh, everyone has, it doesn't matter what uh, field you've been in, that uh, uh, a uh, parts shortage or a supply shortage, uh, uh, you know, whether we've got a, uh, a late delivery on uh, uh, or a six month lead time to order something, it seems like that that uh, has come come to be uh, something that we're having to deal with, whether it's, uh, you know, coming from John Deere, from Case, uh, Freightliner, it uh, seems like that you can get uh, most of the parts you need. You try to find a workaround for the things that you can't get, and uh, uh, you just need to kind of move ahead and, and uh, figure on that, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you're going to have the parts on hand that you're going to need in case there's a breakdown this fall. 
Pete, you mentioned that your uh, family has been farming for, for quite a number of years. Is there anything in the past to compare this to some of the things you're looking at now? Um, have we ran into these problems in the past? So I don't know if we've run into uh, the supply chain issue that we have. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as we've gone through this is the amount of technology uh, that we've added, uh, you know, just to our, our machinery and, uh, you know, and just the things that we're able to do. Um, it almost seems like we're spending a little less time out in the field and, uh, uh, you know, more time making sure that uh, our, uh, you know, our maps look right. And we're watching, you know, we've got digital rain gauges out uh, in uh, uh, different corners of the farm. Um, we've got uh, satellite imagery that we can uh, see where the stress is in the field. And uh, so we can, we can watch all those uh, uh, parts of our, our growing, uh, our growing year, our growing season. But uh, as we have all these sensors on the tractors and the combines, it seems like we've become to rely on that uh, technology and, and the machine it, itself, you know, the, you've got a lot of safeties in there that are con, you know, going to prevent, uh, you know, a, a machine catastrophe by a sensor telling you that you've got a bearing going out. The, but on the same side, you've got uh, a sensor that goes out that you can't, you know, go ahead and move forward because you're waiting on uh, uh, the sensor to be either repaired or just shut off so that you can move ahead. So, in back to your question of you know what have we seen? We've seen inflation, uh, you know, like we had in the '70s and the '80s, where we've had, uh, you know. Uh, huge jumps in land values and machinery values. One of the differences of uh, the inflation uh, that we had seen in the 70s and 80s is the interest rates are uh, much lower uh, at this point in time where uh, my parents had seen uh, interest rates 10, 15, 20 percent uh, you know, for some of their operating uh, funds. You know, we're even though we're seeing a jump from you know, maybe uh, uh, 3% uh, for the home mortgages, jumping up to 5.5%. It uh, uh, still is uh, uh, very manageable in terms of your cost of money uh, for what you're borrowing uh, in relation to where the uh, uh, inflation has been. Pete, is there anything else that you would like to add on the topic of you know, preparing for next year that I haven't brought up in this conversation yet? Well, one of the things that uh, everyone has to, uh, is dealing with is, uh, is labor. And we're all trying to um, make sure that we're uh, staffed enough to find uh, enough people to uh, uh, be in the grain cart, um, find enough truck drivers uh, to get this grain out of the field and, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, uh, we can get this harvest done in, in a timely fashion. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we have done is we've changed up the way that we uh, try to um, find people to come to work. That uh, uh, I started talking more with the uh, uh, VOAG instructor in the high school and some of the superintendents. We were we have a small, uh, you know, we're in an area where uh, we have a lot of rural high schools, and uh, I speak with them and. If there are uh, uh, kids that haven't uh, are unsure about whether they're going into a, a college plan, I'm like, we've got a place for you. We can teach you. Um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of this machinery is fairly easy to run. We we can show you how to uh, how to do this. We can put uh, uh, you know put a good deal of money in your pocket for the fall <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and you can decide whether this is something you want to do uh, going forward, or if this is, you know, kind of the incentive to go ahead and uh, uh, further your education, whether you're uh, going into a trade or going into, uh, you know, going into college. So, and uh, on the other side of that, um, a lot of my friends are uh, starting to reach that retirement age, 
And uh, so we've uh, always spoke with them that uh, it's like, uh, you know, once you get done with your uh, uh, day job, we'd, you know, love to have you out for five or six weeks. And, you know, that'll put all the vacation money that you need and, and uh, we can put you to work and, and, uh, you know, we'll try, you know, we're a family operation. So we try to be, you know, flexible to other people's families as well, that you have, uh, uh, you know, family uh, gatherings, you know, go ahead and get together. You need to have these times and we'll figure out a way to keep moving ahead. So we always try to work with our, uh, uh, our employees so that, um, uh, you know, they want to come back and work again next fall. Very good. Well, thank you, Pete, for your perspective on preparing for the 2023 growing season. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. You can check out the rest of the video series, including agronomic management and Burris business solutions at brownfieldagnews.com.